Churches of Christ present The Truth in Love. How precious is the good divine by inspiration here. I'm Lawson Mayo, your host. One of the congregations that assists us in bringing the program to you week by week is the Northside Church of Christ, 2001 Lincoln in Fort Worth. These brethren meet for worship at 10 each Sunday morning. They bring the speaker for today to you with the lesson on Armageddon. Our speaker, Stafford North. Today we're hearing a lot about the Battle of Armageddon. Maybe that word Armageddon strikes fear into your heart because so many are saying, this really is what the Bible teaches about how the world is going to come to an end. That right near the end, there'll be this terrible battle and that'll mark the end of everything. In fact, there are those who take a map and point out to us exactly how that's going to take place. So let's look at a map and get this background on it before we begin our study of the idea of the Battle of Armageddon. The idea is that there will be great and terrible warfare over here in the Middle East, that there will be armies that come from the south and armies that come from the north, and these will fight terrible battles. And finally, there'll be a great army of a million, a hundred million men that comes from the uh, land of Italy and the, the revived Roman Empire, and it'll come. And then there'll be a 200 million man army that comes from China, and all this terrible warfare and nuclear holocaust is going to center in the area of Armageddon. Armageddon, of course, uh, is related in the mind of these to a valley called the Valley of Megiddo. And so that's where the center of this conflict will be, and it's going to destroy a third of the inhabitants of the earth. It'll be a terrible battle, and then in the midst of that battle, Jesus Christ will return, and upon his return, he will defeat those who are warring with each other and will establish his own kingdom for a thousand years. Now, we've dealt with various aspects of that story, and of other of our, others of our lessons, but today we're going to talk about uh, entirely the idea of the Battle of Armageddon. And what does the Bible mean when it talks about the idea of the Battle of Armageddon? Well, I want to suggest to you, first of all, this, uh, in this lesson, that Armageddon is not a physical battle marking the end of our age. Whatever the Bible, Bible means by the idea of Armageddon, it is not a physical battle marking the end of our age. Now, the only place in the Bible that the Battle of Armageddon or the War of Armageddon or the place of Armageddon, the only, the only place where that phrase occurs or that word occurs, Armageddon, is in Revelation chapter 16 and verse uh, 16. Now, let's get the concept here of what's going on. And if you have your Bible, you may want to open it to Revelation chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. Here in the midst of the story of the book of Revelation, it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, unclean spirits, as it were frogs. And these uh, frog-looking objects come out of the mouths of three figures in the book of Revelation. And three, these three frogs are called messengers, and they go to the kings of the world. And they say to these kings, gather together your forces at a place called Armageddon. That's verse 16. And they gathered them together into the place that's called Armageddon. Now, 
What is this about? Well, first of all, I want to suggest to you that the concept of Armageddon is not a battle that marks the end of our age because, first of all, it is highly symbolic. This passage is a highly symbolic passage. And to give it a meaning of uh, suggesting that all of these things should be taken literally is to misunderstand the passage. Just think for a moment of the symbols in this passage. Let's look at our board over here. And we'll point out these three symbolic characters that are mentioned in this passage. It talks about a great dragon. And a frog comes out of the mouth of the dragon. I'm not sure out of which one of the seven heads the frog comes, but a frog comes out of the mouth of the dragon. And then there's a frog that comes out of the mouth of the beast. This beast also has seven heads. And a frog comes out of this seven-headed beast. And then a frog comes out of the mouth of the false prophet or second beast. And these three frogs go as emissaries to kings. Now we have to recognize we're in the midst of a passage that's symbolic. The dragon is symbolic. The beast is symbolic. The second beast or false prophet is symbolic. The frogs are symbolic. And so we expect whatever Armageddon means that it is a symbolic meaning. That Armageddon does not mean the place, the valley or hill of Megiddo, but rather, it's a symbolic concept of some kind. We'll look in a moment about the meaning of that, but right now we're simply suggesting that we're in the midst of a symbolic passage. And to take all of these things as symbolic, and then to take the idea of Armageddon and to make it uh, a literal place is to miss the symbolism of the passage. Now let's look at a second reason why we believe that Armageddon is not a physical battle marking the end of the age, but rather is to be given some other meaning. The second reason is because these symbols represent events already past. When we read what these things are about and understand the place in the book of Revelation that these events have, we understand that we're dealing here with events that have already taken place and not something that is still future from our standpoint. So from our point in time, the 20th century, the events suggested in Revelation 16 have already taken place. Now if that's true, then obviously they're not describing something that comes at the end of the world. So let's see what this means, and if indeed it does mean that it's already passed, we'll understand that Armageddon does not apply to the end of the world. Now, Revelation identifies who these figures are. The dragon is Satan, Revelation 12, verse 9, Revelation 20, verse 2. No doubt about that. The first beast, the seven-headed red beast, is also identified. In chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, the beast is introduced. In chapter 17, other details are given. And as we've learned in other lessons, all of this put together suggests that this first beast is the Roman Empire. And most of those who write on the book of Revelation agree that this symbolizes the Roman Empire. Now, some say it's the Roman Empire revived and he has to come back because he's gone. And if it's the Roman Empire, it's got to come back. But they miss the point that maybe this all happened when the Roman Empire was here the first time. And that's the position which we're taking in these lessons. So the first beast is the Roman Empire. The second beast, represented by the lamb with two horns. The second beast represents those that enforced emperor worship. And so... We recognize then that Satan, as the dragon, is behind the scenes carrying out his work to try to destroy the church. He brings up the Roman Empire as his helper. And then he brings up those who would uh, use the Roman Empire as a god and the, uh, the rulers, the emperors of the Roman Empire as gods and divine. And that would go around setting up images of them. And that's the second beast, those that set up the images of the first beast and require people to worship. And so all of these things are suggested by the symbols in Revelation chapter 16. Now, when the call for the uh, kings to bring their armies to Armageddon goes out, we are in the storyline of the book of Revelation between the pouring out of the sixth and the seventh bowls. Now, as the bowls have been poured out, various things have taken place. As the first four bowls were poured out, something happened on various aspects of nature. 
the first bowl is poured out and sores break out on those who are following the beast. The second bowl is poured out and is poured out onto the uh, seas and everything in the seas dies. The third bowl is poured out on the rivers and the rivers turn to blood and those who have spilled the blood of the saints have to drink the waters of the river and they die. The fourth bowl is poured out on the sun and it becomes very bright and burns and scorches those um, who are on the earth and they blaspheme God. And so we have all of these poured out against those who are following the beast, but they're also poured out on different aspects of nature. The earth, where the people are that have the sores, the seas, the oceans, the rivers, and the sky. This encompasses all aspects of nature and suggests that God is going to direct nature against the Roman Empire and that the upheavals in nature will become one of the forces that brings the Roman Empire down. And that's exactly what happened as histories of the Roman Empire will bear out. The fifth bowl is poured out on the beast, on the throne of the beast himself. And it turns to darkness, suggesting the idea that the throne, the leadership becomes darkened and leads the nation in immorality and upheaval and internal dissension. And as all of that's taking place, the empire is getting weaker because that's God's way of turning evil against itself. As the sixth bowl is poured out, the sixth bowl is poured out uh, upon the Euphrates River. And as it's poured out on the Euphrates, it dries up and invaders come against the Roman Empire from across its border, the, the Euphrates River, suggesting the final means by which the empire will be destroyed, the outside attacks. If you read in histories of the Book of Rome, you'll find that upheavals of nature, internal dissension and immorality, and outside attacks are the three primary reasons why Rome fell. Now God has unleashed these forces and they're at work. Rome is the great persecutor of the church. Satan is using Rome to try to stamp out the church. God says, it's gone far enough, I'm going to bring it in, and I'm going to bring the empire down for having participated in these things under the influence of Satan. And so these forces are at work, and they're suggested by the pouring out of these six bowls. Now before we have the seventh bowl, there's an interlude. And during that interlude, the dragon and the two beasts send out frogs or emissaries to try to rally their forces this suggests not the idea of a material, physical warfare against God or against the forces that are bringing down the Roman Empire, but rather it symbolizes the concept that Satan and the beasts are not going to give up without a fight. They're going to try to rally their forces and, and hang on. They're not going to go down easily. And so they call their forces to stand at Armageddon. Armageddon is a, is a symbolic place too. And so the idea here is that Armageddon is a, is a symbol to, the Old to those who knew the Old Testament of a place of great warfare and struggle. The Valley of Megiddo was the place where um, the judges won great victories. Deborah defeated uh, Sisera there. Uh, Gideon defeated the Midianites there. That's where uh, Saul was slain. It's where... Uh, Josiah was slain. It's the, it was a place of great battle, and it symbolized, in the minds of those who knew the Old Testament, a place of great conflict. When we use the word Waterloo, we understand that's a great battlefield, but we don't think of it as just being a place. We think of it as being a concept. The concept is defeat, because that's where Napoleon went down to defeat. And so when we say Armageddon here, it doesn't mean going to the physical location where there were great battles. It means the idea, the concept of a struggle. Satan rallies his forces, as it were, at Armageddon to try to hang on. It's a climactic struggle between God and Satan. Not a physical battle on earth, but a climactic struggle behind the scenes. And then when uh, that takes place, we go on to the pouring out of the seventh bowl, and the uh, seventh bowl is poured out and the, the word simply goes out, it's done. It's all over. God has done what he intended to do. The city breaks in three pieces. The city representing the power of Rome, the Roman Empire, 
Uh, that's uh, in the last verses of Revelation 16. Also over in chapter 17, verse 18, we see the great city is suggested there again as ruling over many people, and that city is going down to defeat. So God is bringing down the Roman Empire, and when the seventh bowl is poured out, Rome is broken into three pieces, and it's all done. There's no great warfare described. There's no great struggle described. It's sort of a matter of the Satan uh, tries to rally his troops, as it were, symbolically trying to hang on, the Roman Empire trying to hang on, but when God has decreed that Babylon will fall, Rome will fall, then it's going to happen. And so with the pouring out of the seventh bowl, that takes place and the great city breaks in three pieces. Now, if this understanding of Revelation 16 is correct, then we're right in saying the events described here have already taken place. They're already passed. And so this is not a description of what will happen to the end of the world. Rather, it's a description of something that has already taken place. Now, let's look at a third reason why we do not believe the idea of Armageddon suggests a great battle, physical battle, that comes at the end of the world. And the third reason is that this is not the end of the world that's being described here. It's not the end of the world. Now, we can understand this because, first of all, these events are directed against Rome. Even how Lindsay and others agree that this is something directed against Rome. But they say, since it didn't happen to the first Roman Empire in their mind, since all the things that they understand didn't happen the first time, God has to bring back the Roman Empire so it can all happen again. Well, rather than bringing back the Roman Empire, we'd be better off to understand how these things did take place during the first uh, coming of the Roman Empire. And so it happened then, and we do not have to find the Roman Empire coming back. And because these ideas are directed against the Roman Empire, we understand it's not dealing with the end of the world. But there's another reason suggested in this same chapter, chapter 16, verse 21. After the pouring out of the seventh bowl, those who are affected by the pouring out of that bowl, that is the great city, they blaspheme God. Men are still alive. They're still on the earth. They're still in the city and places related to the city. And they go about blaspheming God. Now, when the end of the world comes, following the, uh, the coming of Jesus and the end of the world, people will not be going around blaspheming God. They will not still be alive on the earth. Rather, at that time, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Philippians 2. It will not be a time for people to blaspheme, but for a time, a time for people to confess and for, time, for people to be judged. And so... This passage clearly is not about the end of the world, and therefore the concept of Armageddon suggested here is not about the end of the world either. Now let's look at a fourth reason why we understand that the uh, battle pictured here uh, is, or the idea, the concept pictured here is not of the final end of the world. It's because the story in the book of Revelation was to happen soon after it was given in the first century. The concepts in the book of Revelation are about things that would happen soon. Now, remember the book of Revelation was written in the first century. It was delivered to Christians of the first century. It was delivered to them because they were in a time of terrible persecution. As they came to that persecution, they were asking in their own minds, what's all this about? How long will it go on? Is it worth standing and giving your life for the cause of Christ if the Roman Empire is going to snuff it out? And of course, God is writing to tell these people, yes, it is worthwhile to stand. It is worthwhile to be persecuted. I understand what's going on. I am still in control. I have allowed Satan to exercise certain things that he wants to do, but I am still in control, and when the time comes, I'll bring that to an end, and I'll bring the persecutor down. And that's the message, the underlying message of the book. Now, we're told in that book itself something of the time frame in which those events which it describes are going to take place. And if we understand the basic time frame of the book of Revelation, then we will understand something about the fact that the idea of Armageddon in chapter 16 is not about the end of the world. If you look at four verses with me, I think you'll understand how the book of Revelation is written 
not primarily about things that will happen at the end of the world, but primarily about things that would happen within the range, the view of those who lived in the first century, and extending on for a time as these things uh, ran their course. But these things would happen soon from the standpoint of those who first received the book. The book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first chapter and the first verse, tells us something about the time that's involved in the events of the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show on his servants, even the things which must shortly come to pass. These things, he says, the message that I'm about to deliver to you is about things that are going to happen shortly, things that will happen soon, things that are going to begin to take place in a short span of time and will continue until before along it'll all be done. In the third verse of Revelation chapter 1, Blessed uh, is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. It's going to happen soon. These events will begin to unfold shortly. And the main thrust of this book is about what will happen soon. The Roman Empire is now persecuting you. I'm talking about how I'm going to bring that empire that's persecuting you right now, how I'll bring it down, and how I'll bring it into the persecution, and what will happen to you afterwards. That's the message of the book. In Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter, verse 10, the writer is told, do not seal up the prophecy of this book because it's going to happen soon. Now, the book of Daniel uh, was to be sealed up because its event would not happen very soon, though they began to happen some three or four hundred years later. But this book, we're told, was to be left open, not sealed, so that the uh, people would recognize these things are going to happen soon. Now, that's put in contrast with the book of Daniel. The prophecies of Daniel didn't, weren't fulfilled for three or four or five hundred years. These prophecies are going to be carried out in less time than that. So the main thrust of the book is not about the end of the world. Finally, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, we read, Behold, I come quickly. Now, Jesus was not there talking about his second coming to bring the world to an end, or else he didn't come quickly. But he was talking about, I come quickly in a symbolic way to do the things I've described in this book. I'm coming soon to carry out what I've said I will do. Now, Jesus can still be in heaven and still come if he sends his power on the earth and brings to pass what he said he will do, he has come. And so he was coming to carry out the things that were written in this book. And he says, I'm coming to do them soon. We realize then as a fourth reason that the battle of Armageddon described in chapter 16 is not something that's about the end of the world, a great battle at the end of the world in a physical sense because it was something that would happen soon in the storyline of the book of Revelation itself. Now let's turn to a fifth reason why we understand that the book, the uh, story of Armageddon as told in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation is not uh, the uh, end of the world, does not deal with that subject, is not about the final moment in history, because our age will not end with a series of events which will allow us to make a countdown to the end. Our age will not end with a series of events that will allow us to make a countdown to the end. Hal Lindsey's, uh, Hal Lindsey's lately written a book called The 1980s, Countdown to Armageddon. Countdown. See, he says these events are so specific that we can tell exactly when it's coming to pass and we can point to a specific time frame. It's going to happen within the lifetime of those now alive. And that's his idea of this uh, coming of Armageddon and the end of the world. But the Bible makes it clear that we're given no such signs. We're not going to be able to have a countdown to the end. And the idea of Armageddon in Revelation 16 is not something toward which we can have a countdown. Matthew chapter 23, first of all, makes that point. In verses 36 through 39 uh, of, uh, the, of Matthew 23, Jesus predicts the coming fall of Jerusalem. Then he comes on over into Matthew 24, and there he again makes similar predictions. And in chapter 36, 
through 39, he puts in contrast the fall of the, uh, the coming of the end of the world in contrast with the fall of Jerusalem that he described beginning in chapter 23 and moving down through verse 34 of the, 30, of the 24th chapter. That's about the fall of Jerusalem. Now in verse 36, he comes to a different concept. And there he says, you can't know when this is going to be. I don't know when the end of the world is coming. Nobody knows. The angels don't know. Only God knows. I can't tell you when this is going to be. There won't be signs of when it's going to happen, he says. Life will be going on as usual as it was in the days of Noah. People were eating and drinking and marrying and going on with life as usual until the day Noah went into the ark. And so it will be at the end of the world. There won't be signs by which you can tell. There will be no unusual events. There won't be a buildup of events climaxing in a battle of Armageddon by which you can measure how far we are from the end of time. Oh, no, he says. It will come like a thief. He says it's going to be unexpected. People are not going to know when this is going to take place. Well, he says it's like a servant whose master is away. The servant doesn't know when the master is going to return, and so he needs to watch and be ready all the time because he doesn't know when the master is coming back, and we don't know when Christ will return. He goes on in chapter 25 even to talk about the story of the wise and foolish virgins and the need to be ready all the time because we don't know when the bridegroom is coming. All of these things suggest to us very clearly that we cannot predict the time of the end by signs, and the build-up to a great climactic battle at the end of time is not at all what the Bible is talking about. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2, we read about the, day, the great day of the Lord, the end of the world, and there we're told it's going to come like a thief in the night. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10 talks about that great day of the Lord when the elements will be dissolved with fervent heat. And how is that going to happen? Is there a countdown we can make? Can we tell exactly when it's going to be? Will this be a great battle of Armageddon that's been preceded by seven years of conflict and, I, and things that we can uh, notice and make note of and, uh, and uh, set a timetable for? Oh, no. There again, 2 Peter 3.10, it'll come like a thief in the night. Has your house ever been robbed? Mine has. The thief never gave me a telephone call. He didn't tell me when he was coming. It was unexpected. And so it will be with the end of the world. It's going to be unexpected. We're not going to know when it is. And so the concept of Armageddon and the, and the signs that one, uh, some think they can use as predicting when it's going to happen, this is not a biblical teaching. There is no great battle with which the end of the world is coming, and there are no signs by which we can tell that it's about to take place. Rather, this concept of Armageddon fits into the storyline of the book of Revelation. It's dealing with the Roman Empire and its fall and the struggle by Satan and the Roman Empire and its supporters to try to keep it propped up. And God says, they'll try, but it won't work. I'll pour out the seventh bowl and then it's done. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by Churches of Christ. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write, the Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area.